I've been saying this before the pandemic. This is a very, very tough business, you know, and I think I think the problem is, is that when chefs get on these interviews, you know, whether before or after the pandemic and tell you what what a tough business this is to make money in, I don't think anyone takes us seriously enough. And, you know, customers keep coming out. It's incredibly competitive. You know, we want to pay our staff well. We want to charge a very fair price. But that model is just set up for disaster. So I, I think in the sense of culture in the restaurant business and the kitchens especially, I think we've come a long, long way. I think the biggest problem is the financial model of the restaurant. And every chef will tell you the same thing. Everyone thinks that a sh- restaurant owner is a millionaire, that we make a fortune. Because I think a lot of times, this is one of these type of businesses where they can see what we're taking in. They have no idea how much of that goes back out. And it's usually about 80 to 90, sometimes 95% of that goes back out. How, in your right mind, do you make that kind of model work? And you know, so I've always said, anyone smart enough to make money in this business is probably smart enough to have not gotten into it in the first place. Behind every amazing flavor is an amazing human who has perfected their craft. Welcome to Flavors Unknown. A behind the scenes look at new flavors and the chefs, pastry chefs, and bartenders who create them with your host, Emmanuel. Today, my guest is a pioneer of the modern plant-based dining experience. Chef Richard Lando from Philadelphia created his first plant-based restaurant back in 1994, way before the current trends of veggies at the center of the plate or plant-based protein diet. Welcome to episode 67 of my podcast, Flavors Unknown. I am your host, Emmanuel Laroche. And if you are new to the podcast, I have been in the food industry for more than 20 years, both in Europe and in the US. And every other week, I share true stories, successes, and challenges from US culinary leaders and how their cultural identity shaped their creative process. You can listen to all the episodes on my website, flavorsunknown.com. Please sign up for the newsletter as you do not want to miss any future episodes. Lando shares his viewpoint on the restaurant industry, his restaurant concepts, veg in Philly and fancy radish in Washington, D.C., and how to make flavors shine when you only focus on veggies. Hi, Chef. Uh, Welcome to Flavors Unknown. I'm really excited to have you on the show tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Very good. So how are you doing? You know, I have to ask you the question, you know, at the moment, it's like a really, a really crazy time. And uh, I'm curious how you are navigating through this, you know, like a uh, very difficult situation. It's funny when you ask someone how they're doing, it has to be like, well, how are you doing this week? How are you doing today? How yeah. are you doing overall? I mean, you know, listen, we're, you know, my wife and I are fine. We're healthy. I'm knocking on wood. We're navigating our way through this. There's some very, very challenging days and some very challenging situations presented with everything that's going on right now. But we're hanging in there. I mean, we're, we're positive. We're optimistic. We're doing everything we can to get to the other side of this. So we, we are doing okay. We didn't have to close it. We, we thought we were making the responsible choice by doing that. When these kind of things happen, not that they happen that often, but you know, they really make you evaluate what you're doing with your life. It makes you evaluate what you're doing with your business. And we didn't see any way we could keep the two restaurants afloat in Center City. It just wasn't going to happen. You know, veg is our anchor. It's our baby. It's our original. It was tough with V Street because you never forget your first, second restaurant. <laughs> so, you know, we uh, it was we love that place so much. It was a very, very difficult decision. But we also you can't get yourself in a situation where if you're trying to make both survive, they could both be in jeopardy. Sure. So we put everything we had into veg, veg. And, and then and you get right like veg open then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. veg is open. And it was the okay. right move in retrospect. I don't think it would have worked out any other way. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot of chefs, you know, that uh, I had on the show and uh, since the beginning of the the pandemic, and uh, they really said that, uh, you know, the restaurant industry has been long overdue, you know, for meaningful change. And I know, and I read, you know, several, you know, interviews that you have done that you are sharing that opinion. So can you explain to us like your thoughts on this? I've been saying this before the pandemic. This is a very, very tough business, you know, and I think I think the problem is, is that when chefs get on these interviews, you know, whether before or after the pandemic and tell you what, what a tough business this is to make money in, I don't think anyone takes us seriously enough. 
And, you know, customers keep coming out. Uh, you, you know, we keep, there's a, it's incredibly competitive. You know, we want to pay our staff well. We want to charge a very fair price. But that model is just set up for disaster. So in the sense of culture in the restaurant business and the kitchens especially, I think we've come a long, long way. You know, I, I was a hot-headed 20-something at one point trying to find my way, just just getting my ass kicked left and right. And it's a very, very difficult thing. And it, it becomes a very emotional thing. But as I grew older and I grew up, you know, you mellow out a little bit and you start to really, um, you start to create this family around you and, and you create this culture in your restaurants, which, you know, my wife, Kate, and I were very proud of. We had people that have been with us, still with us, eight, nine, 10 years. I mean, it's just amazing. And, and you don't have people stay with you that long if you're a bad operator. So we were comfortable with that. And I know a lot of, uh, you know, as far as equality goes, as far as, you know, getting, uh, you know, kind of getting rid of sexism, getting rid of racism in the industry, we've got a long way to go, but we've also come a long way. And, you know, we we're, I was talking to a group of chefs about this the other day. Let's not discount how far we have come. We are by all means a work in progress. So I see a lot of positivity there. I think the biggest problem is the financial model of the restaurant. And every chef will tell you the same thing. Everyone thinks that a sh restaurant owner is a millionaire that we make a fortune. Because I think a lot of times, this is one of these type of businesses where they can see what we're taking in. And a couple of clicks of a computer button on your, you know, on your point of sale, they can see what we're taking in. They have no idea how much of that goes back out. And it's usually about 80 to 90, sometimes 95% of that goes back out. How in your right mind do you make that kind of model work? And you know, so I've always said, anyone smart enough to make money in this business is probably smart enough to have not gotten into it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So that we have to fix that. We have to fix that. And do you think um, that's the um, the the level and of skill sets of you know the employees and uh, you know like the the young cooks you know are changing or is changing as well? That was um, a discussion that I had with many chefs you know on on the show where they thought that uh, it, it was difficult with the younger generation to have a long-term commitment. A lot of them are fascinated with, maybe not now since the beginning of the pandemic, but before that, you know, with the whole situation of the, the stardom of like celebrity chef, you know, the TV shows and so on. And then when they start working, they, you know, it's a different reality. It's a very hard job. So um, I, I, I'm curious to have your, your thoughts on it. Well, it is a very hard job, and I've, I'm always up front with people in interviews during that, trying never to candy coat it, because I think a lot of people are fascinated by it. They watched Anthony Bourdain. They read his book. And you know, if you really look at Anthony Bourdain's first book, uh, Kitchen Confidential, and really read it for what it is, it was a warning sign. It was like, do not work in restaurants. Do not eat in restaurants. <laughs> it's just a disaster. It's a, it's a very dysfunctional, very problematic industry. Yet people were fascinated by it. They drank it up. And these kids wanted to do this badass thing. I mean, I was one of them. You know, I came from, you know, basically a middle class family. They put away money for college for me. And I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to work. And I wanted to cook. And it was hard because wanting to cook. It's like you ever hear those home chefs and all their friends are like, oh, you, you should open up a restaurant. And like, don't, you know, <laughs> don't open up a restaurant ever. It, you have to really, you know, when I got into a kitchen finally, because I love to cook so much, I got my ass kicked and I stuck with it. But I never once said, wow, this is easy. I mean, this is, it's hard work. It's extremely hot in there. It's very dangerous in there. You can get burnt or cut very easily. And all of us do. We all have scars that we'll have forever because of this. Now, that being said, back about 25 years ago, you would attract this, you know, basically a blue collar crowd. They were either doing this or they were doing construction work or roofers or anything. And I used to work on a golf course, you know, I, you know, cutting the greens and all that. So I, I know this, this is like that blue collar mentality. You get in there and they'd say, oh my God, you're going to give me a job. I'll stay with you forever. I can't believe you would hire me. It was a, basically a place for misfits. But now it's like, uh, you know, in the past decade, these kids are coming from more white collar backgrounds. They're college ed educated. And they're smart. Now, a lot of them do work very hard. I'll, get, I'll take my hat off to them, but they're smart. And they're always saying, how can I make this better? And I appreciate that because I've always been looking for that too. They're, so, so they're going to demand a little bit more from, from this industry moving forward. They're going to say, okay, this is a dangerous job. It is an incredibly exhausting, tiring job. Let's find ways that we can make it better. Maybe it is, you know, people glorify this 80-hour work week. I mean, I've done it. 
I did for years, man. I mean, it's, it is not a battle scar. It's not a badge of honor. It sucked. Sure. I mean, it's very, very I difficult. Mean, you need to have so. a thick skin, definitely, in that business. Oh, my God, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> so anyway, I mean. <laughs> Literally, I, like, uh, you know, and uh, as well, because you were talking about the cuts and the burns, but but as well, you know, like the whole environment and and people working there and, and how tough it is. So Yeah, well, it's exhausting. You know, a lot, I, during interviews, you hear people say, well, listen, I, I'll work six days a week, you know, and I'll, uh, I'll work seven days a week, 90 hours. I don't care. Well, they might do it, but by Saturday night, you have a zombie on your hands <laughs> and uh, yeah. I've been there. So I, I think a, a sensible work week is where we begin with, uh, you know, really sensible pay. You know, I think we all have to admit after a while, I'll be the first one to say this. You're not going to become a millionaire working in this business on any level unless you own national multiple, you know, pieces of a chain or something like that. Can you earn a decent living? Yeah, you should be able to survive in this business. We have to we have to figure out what's fair here and then make sure that everyone's happy in this business. So yeah, meaningful change. Absolutely. It's coming absolutely. our way. Where, where do you see the industry um, going in the future? You know, especially Where's, with this, you know, pandemic. Well, I'm hoping that I don't think this is going to happen, but my goal is to strip it down to its essentials, which is people cooking your food for dinner. You come into a restaurant, you know, maybe we have to rewire the customer's mentality too and say, listen, we're, we're not your servants for the night. We're not, you know, we're not beholden to you. We're not going to make you anything you want from the menu. We're not going to switch up the whole menu. This is what we're cooking. Come in, pay us a fair price. We'll cook your food. Done. Maybe we need to strip it down of the celebrity of the um, of these kind of illusions that you're going to get rich, that you're going to be famous, that you're going to be on TV. It's hands on job. It's a beautiful thing to cook food, and quite honestly, that should be enough. The the sheer well, satisfaction. There's going to be maybe like two two paths. You know, there's going to be the people that maybe can still become celebrity chef and on TV, but they don't own a restaurant, and you know they don't they don't have a brick and mortar. And you have, you know, other people that will, you know, feed the people. So, well, yeah, you know, you're talking about two different animals there. I mean, the celebrity chefs on TV, when I was growing up, you know, you had uh, basically, I mean, this is even before my time, you had uh, the Galloping Gourmet, Graham, Graham Kerr, and Julia Child. These, these were instructors. These were not celebrity chefs. They never really worked in restaurants in that kind of leadership role. They never did food costs or anything. They were, um, they were instructors. Now, I have no problem with that. But when you go to a restaurant and you all you want to do is get on the next TV game show, it's a huge distraction. It takes you away from what you really want to do. I started in 94 doing this. And to me, I just wanted to cook. I want to cook. I want to make enough money to survive. And that was it. And I was very happy doing that. But the pressures of expansion as you go on with this, the pressures of Oh my God, being on TV, getting on Instagram recently. I mean, it's, it's just, I'm like, this is just a colossal distraction from what we're supposed to be doing. So my vision for our industry in the future is just strip down, cook the food, mm-hmm. customer pays the bill, enjoys it, and we all live happily ever after. And more, and more fast casual in most concept than fine dining or? Well, I'm a fan of all types of dining. I, I love fast casual because when I'm hungry, I need food five minutes ago. Uh, and I love where fast casual is going because there's a lot of quality now in fast casual. It was a dirty word 10 years ago because fast casual meant unhealthy, greasy, you know, bad, bad for your food. Fast casual is really going in a great direction. And there's a lot of middle, middle of the road restaurants right now. Uh, chefs who are just, you know, got out there and got their life savings, got found a little shoebox opened up and they're cooking beautiful food. What I miss the most is fine dining. And that is pretty much gone. I love that because I don't get out to eat that much. So there's some nights, it's like being on vacation. You sit down in a nice chair and you're really well taken care of. And it's, you know, it's expensive, but man, what a beautiful experience to have this like parade of courses of beautiful food come out and good wine and you have a cocktail first and it takes like three hours. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, it's like a trip to the Bahamas almost. <laughs> what do you think about uh, Ghost Kitchen? Yeah, there are a lot of people talking about it, you know, at the moment. Obviously, it's much less investment, you know, than brick and mortar. So I'm a huge fan of that because I, we've considered it. We are in a very, very high rent district where we are. And that has been just killing us because we're basically a takeout window with a, an enormous, enormous uh, monthly nut hanging over us with rent. So we're like, well, wait a second. With delivery these days, we could be anywhere for like literally a fraction of this rent cost. 
So I'm a, I'm a big fan of that. You're going to see a lot more of that. I am not a big fan of the illegal ones I'm seeing going on here. I want everyone to get a fair chance to work a living, but earn a living here. But I mean, I spent years going through everything, doing it right, everything legit, all the paperwork, all the training and all that. It's not kind of fair if someone just opens up their apartment kitchen and starts selling stuff out of there. It's not a level playing field. So I think we have to be careful. And someone's, get, someone's going to get sick doing that. People so. safety. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So can you talk to us about um, your two restaurants? This has been my whole culinary journey. I started off in 94, like I said. Uh, my sole mission was to show people that they did not need to eat meat to have a great meal. I'm not trying to convert anyone. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm not trying to tell you what to think, what to eat, because nobody likes that. But I just wanted to demonstrate this. I mean, I, I guess it's kind of a Buddhist thing when you think about it that you... Um, we kind of lead by example. If you can make someone a great meal and they never missed meat, then you're successful. So that took on, that evolved over the years, that concept. I dabbled a little bit with mock meats in the beginning. That wasn't really for me. Then I moved more into the, you know, the ancient proteins of like tofu. I did a little seitan early on, but mostly it was the vegetables that I loved. So in, um, in 2011, when we opened Veg, that became like the kind of our little gastronomic temple of uh, vegetable cuisine. I wanted to be like, you know, listen, you got like a steakhouse, you got a seafood house, you got, I want this to be the vegetable house. I wanted to show people how absolutely delicious vegetables can be, whether you're vegan or not. I mean, it really doesn't matter to me. I'm not here to judge. I just want to cook you great food from the heart and show how incredible vegetables can be because for years they've been side dishes. For years they've just been treated so badly. It took time to put veggies in the center of the plate, huh? Long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> sure. they, were always, they were just a little it's oiled 2011, and so how, how, do you, how did you make people think about vegetables like in, in a different way? You know, oh, nowadays, true. you know, it's, you know, front and center. There's a lot of things around, you know, vegetables in general. It doesn't have to be vegetarian restaurant or vegan. But in 2011, you know, that, that was different. It was definitely a bold step. I mean, it was always a bold step with whatever we did because, it you know, it's a, not an easy business to make money and most, or an easy concept to make money. And most chefs will tell you vegetables, if you really want good vegetables, they're very expensive and it drives your food cost crazy. So, uh, you know, it was always a risk, but, you know, for us, it, you know, the, the whole concept itself was for me very, very, very simple. It's not something I had to brainstorm about and assemble a think tank and, get opinions. I knew exactly what I wanted to do because I'm a carnivore at heart. I miss meat so much. I mean, I all, I just love to be able to eat meat. I won't do it because, because of ethical reasons. So, you know, I was in love with all these flavors I grew up with, you know, Jewish deli flavors, barbecue. Oh my God, you name it. I just, I ate it and I, I loved it. So when I had this ethical aversion to eating meat, I said, well, I, I can't be one of those people that just go, keeps doing it after you've already learned the truth about it. And so I, I had to find a way to keep my palate entertained. I had to find a way to satisfy this, carni this carnivorous side of me. So basically, instead of making vegetables health food and salads and <laughs> stir fry, veggie lasagna and all that stuff, I, I, really, I started really cooking vegetables like people would cook meat. And um, I got all those flavors in there. And that's when... So you charred, know, you know, them and... Charred, yeah. smoky, roasted, smoky, caramelized, yeah. all that yeah. stuff. I mean, I, you know, and I, I hit this like aha moment where I was like, wait a second, was it really meat that tasted so good or, or was it what the chefs did to it? And, and I said, well, wait a second, I, I'm just going to keep on this path with vegetables doing that. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a great journey because I, I eat my food all the time because I, that keeps my palate really happy and I don't have to... I don't have to like put on disguise and sneak into a steakhouse or anything. <laughs> so, oh yeah, and so you're talking about ethical reason. Uh, you know, a lot of people going into eating more vegetable because of you know being concerned about the environment or you know the animal welfare or you know I'm guess I think like getting older as well. It's like personal health. What's your take on the, on those uh, current trends at the moment? Because it's again front and center. You know. Today. Well, I think I think you hit the nail on the head with the three reasons people would go this route. I mean, for me, it was strictly ethical in the beginning. I mean, I was a teenager, you know, so you know how teenagers are, uh, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, in the 90s, when uh, Clinton was in the White House and Al Gore was president, 
there was a, an environmental aspect to it. We realized that one of the worst causes of uh, greenhouse gases was the kind of uh, the growing of cattle, you know, for, for food. It, it, and you think of the whole system, you know, and I, I never like to get into this all this stuff. There's a million people you can talk to who are smarter than me in this, but I think the biggest change is number three that you just touched on, and that's personal health. And that's that people they either look in the mirror and see themselves getting a little bit older and want to clean up their diet. They're tired. They're, um, you know, people are on medication like crazy these days. Man, all this can be fixed with diet. I, well, I'm not a doctor, but almost all this can be fixed with diet. And people are realizing that. People get a bad report from their doctor. Their cholesterol is out of control. Well, there's only one way to get cholesterol. That's from animal products. So, you know, you have a choice. You go on Lipitor or you start eating more of a plant-based diet. So people are seeing this. It's very, very obvious. And they're seeing the, the results. Now, I think that's been the biggest change is that people, you know, listen, as America, we're, we're a vain society. And when you can feel better and look better and be healthier and avoid maybe some of those bad reports from the doctor, I think people really lean towards this as a very easy way because you still get to eat. You know, you still get to eat really good food. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. What do you think about, i um, curious, what do you think about... Uh, uh, the product like Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger. Oh, I love them. I, I think I think it's like the next generation of like greatness with mock meat products. Now, uh, we don't serve mock meat. It's a one trick pony to me. It's like, oh, yeah, it's a fake burger. It's, but I'll tell you, I love them, man. I mean, we, we eat them, you know, once every week or two at home. I think they're fantastic because they remind me of the really big burgers you had when I was a kid and we do them on the backyard grill because for years, like in the 90s, they had these tiny little Garden burgers, nothing against garden burger, but they, it tasted like health food. It was like oats and grains and nuts. It's like, that's not a burger. Sure. I mean, and, so, and the texture as well. It's fantastic. I mean, some uh, of them, you know, are using jackfruit and, you know, the, the way how the texture is, is uh, really mimicking. Oh, it's know, amazing. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. the biggest thing that comes from this, I mean, I just love them for my own personal pleasure because I get to eat a cheeseburger again. I mean, but the biggest thing that's happening is people like carnivores, like crazy. I'm talking like people mm -hmm. in like Nebraska and they, wherever in the middle of the country, they're eating these and they're saying, whoa, wait a second. So I can eat this and I don't have to eat meat. So you're seeing people being convinced that there is a really satisfying way to live this life. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're not going to go vegetarian and start eating salad and bean sprouts. You're going to, you're going to get to eat really good food. I mean, you, you can make a bacon cheeseburger and it's it's phenomenal. So it's yeah, a, a yeah. great example. I'm guessing that going to your restaurants, there's probably some great stuff to eat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, with uh, with veggies and sprouts and, and all of the good stuff. What do you think is next, you know, in uh, plant-based food? I, I think you'll see some more of this stuff. I think you're going to see, um, I think you'll see chicken take the next big step. There's some great breaded fake chicken stuff out there. To me, if you take the breading off of it, it's not as as good. I think you're going to see chicken become the next big thing. Uh, KFC is going to be launching a Beyond Chicken. I think you'll see a lot more fast food places really jump on this this trend. McDonald's is supposedly doing it. So I think you'll see a lot. There's some guys out there doing um, fake seafood. That's bold. That's bold because most people don't see seafood as a problem. So that I'd like to see how that evolves. I think cheese is going to be the next big thing. There's some people out there doing some. You're talking to a French guy here, so I'm, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> my, um, my gold standard is really high. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> no, there's there's some. Uh, I think uh, you know people are making nut cheeses these days. Yeah. I like them, but I think you'll you'll start to see some of that uh, evolve. But I think the industry in whole is just going to pour millions into development of these products because you know I mean listen they're corporations, man. I mean I remember in the there used to be a burger out called Boca Burger in the 90s. It was, it was phenomenal. It tasted like a McDonald's hamburger. And it was bought by General Mills. And I'm like, wait a second, what the hell does General Mills want with this, you know, grassroots hippy dippy burger from Florida? And that's when I kind of saw that this whole kind of big, big business coming to this because they they don't give a shit. They just want to they want to make money. So when they're when they see this as something profitable, it's it's a huge sign of where it's going. That's right. Okay. Let's focus a little bit on the, the creative aspect. How do you bring complex flavor to um, vegetable cooking? Well, I think that what you have to start with is 
don't don't expect vegetables to do the work for you. And that is the biggest difference between vegetables and meat. You've got to really, really get some flavor into them. And often that takes a two-step process. Most people are used to just roasting a tray of Brussels sprouts or you throw some broccoli in boiling water. That's fine. If you have really good vegetables, they're delicious. Maybe they don't need much more. But if you really, really want to make a great plant-based entree, you've got to be prepared to get some work into it. It's it's definitely a labor of love, but they're not going to do it on their own. You know, they don't have any fat in them, vegetables. That's that's the biggest problem. So you have to get fat into them. You have to get seasonings into them, you know, and without covering them up, of course, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to just taste like barbecue sauce. You want it to still taste like the vegetable that it is. So, you know, I've, I've spent a quarter century doing this. So, you know, so what I, works I, I, well, I, not, not getting into your secrets, but you know, what works well with, uh, you know, veggies? Well, I am a big fan of the fleshier vegetables because I think they, they most mimic meat. I look for qualities in vegetables that, that can remind me or re, not remind me, but kind of recall, let my palate recall what it's like to eat meat. So for instance, eggplant is very fleshy. You can run a fork through it and will kind of string in a, in a way that most people associate with animal flesh. I love meaty mushrooms, trumpets, portobellas that when you grill them, take on this like really steak-like flavor. You know, there's other vegetables like greens. You know, greens just have to be greens. You're not going to be able to do much more with greens. You're not going to make greens taste like a steak. They're their own thing, but you can still take them in great directions from there. You know, carrots, root vegetables are another thing. So a carrot, if you roast it the right way, skin on, don't peel them. You roast it just so uh, the skin kind of blisters up and gets a little crispy. And it's a, like an effect that I remember, like from, you know, cooking uh, chicken when I was a kid. It doesn't taste like chicken, but of course it, it recalls that. And you, you just kind of, you use the stuff to springboard. Like what can, what can I, what, I'm going to listen to these vegetables. I'm not going to try to force a recipe into them, but I'm going to listen to them and let them take me a place where they're, they're they can easily go. Okay. So uh, what, what are your source, uh, sources of inspiration? For me, the seasons, obviously. I know that's a very cliche answer. I mm-hmm. mean, every chef, you but know. I'm every, guessing you are, you, you're based on the produce, correct? I mean, always on the produce. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's, it's like, I know it's 2021 now. And people are going to start rolling their eyes when chefs are like, oh, I'm inspired by the seasons. Come on. We all are. You know? It's like, we, we all want corn on the cob around the grill in the summertime. We all want the asparagus in the spring. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, a, it's a, you know, time. there's something to say about this because. Now with modern society where you can have access to everything at any time. I mean, I was talking to my daughter yesterday or the day before, and she was doing, doing some recipes with her friends. And this, she said, hey, dad, look, look at it. We are going to do like a crostine like, with like peach. And I said, peach? This is, we are in January in New Jersey. <laughs> you know, talking about peach, why don't you wait you know, uh, and have that in the summer? And I said, no, no, we can, we can do this now. And so there's something to say that, you know, the, you have like the great quality product in the peak of the season, like tomatoes, you know, in the summer and peaches in the summer and, and so on. You know. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, when you, if you read back on the, the history of how this all happened, I mean, back in the thirties and forties, you know, if you got artichokes in January for one of your posh dinner parties, it was considered this incredible luxury. It's like, how did you get artichokes in January? You know, to me, it's it's a double-edged sword. I think humankind has spent a century building up these networks of transportation, and stuff does grow in other parts of the world at different times. You know, you're you don't have to be beholden to the seasons up here. I mean, I drink coffee, I eat avocados, and I, I love orange juice. So right away, I've broken the the locavore kind of thing going on. That being said, there's some things I think are best left to their seasons. Uh, corn and asparagus, I think, are two of them. Oh, what's some other ones? You know, like really the, the like peas and favas are best in the spring. There's no doubt about it. Turnip in the winter, I guess. Oh, yeah. Turnip, Turnip, uh, yeah. Onions, potatoes, mm-hmm. squashes, you know. So there's some stuff that's better. But yeah, by the same token, you know, there's there's great stuff growing south of the equator right now. If they can get it up here in one piece and it tastes good, why not? I mean, let's uh, be easy on ourselves. It's food, right? <laughs> yeah. So what's your first step after, you know, I, I guess the inspiration comes from the, the season and the produce, but what's the first step in creating a new dish for you? There's two rules I go by. Number one, try to do something no one's done before. Don't read a menu and rip off a dish. That kind of drives me crazy because I've seen my dishes all over the place. It's very flattering. Thank you, everybody. But, you know, 
take it in your own direction. You know, cooking is an expression of you. It's not something you want to do that someone else has done. So try to make it original. Do something that no one's done before. It's okay if it, you make a mistake. It's okay if it's not spectacular. You got to be creative. You got to get out there. But number two is you have to keep the vegetables true to what they really are. Um, again, you know, I can put a I can put a quart of barbecue sauce on a carrot and it's going to taste amazing. I can deep fry, you know, asparagus tempura. It's going to taste amazing. That's cheating to me. So let always let. The Why is it cheating to you? Well, because mm -hmm. I think you should let the vegetables speak. We're a vegetable restaurant. People don't come there for for fried panko coating and they don't come there for barbecue sauce. They come there to taste the vegetables. So I, I believe very strongly in that. So we do very, very little frying. I'm not going to tell you we don't do a few goopy sauces every now and then, like a, a light barbecue or teriyaki or something like that. We, I'm not going to say we don't do that, but letting the vegetables, it, never let them question what the star of the dish is. When, they're, when a dish is based around the carrot or the eggplant, they should know they're eating a carrot or eggplant dish. And yeah, and be original, you know, be original and, um, you know, kind of really test yourself. It's a lot. So I, I, I find my best dishes come to me when I'm alone, uh, walking. It could be riding a bike, just sitting somewhere, uh, playing golf. When I can really have that kind of solitude, the dishes come to me very easily. It's very hard to think of them in the kitchen. Very, okay. very hard. Because there's, there's a dish that, that you have you, the most proud of. I, I would say it's still on their menu, been there for a decade. It's called the eggplant brajol. So when we opened veg, I said to myself, we're going to, you know, I said to the staff, actually, we're going to find every vegetable everywhere, whether we like it or not, whether you have a scarred from your child with it or not, we're going to make people love it. And for me, that was like Brussels sprouts, sweet potatoes. I mean, I hated that stuff, but like, we're going to find a way to make this stuff delicious. We are absolutely going to find a way. And eggplant was one of those things that I loved eggplant Parmesan, but you know, I was like, I was under no illusions that- and That's cheating too. It's absolutely eggplant. cheating. You, you don't even need eggplant in there. The eggplant. <laughs> right? You, you got something fried covered with sauce and cheese on a roll. Yes. I mean, you don't need eggplant in there. It's just called Parmesan. <laughs> I mean, you, don't need, you can put anything in there. You can put a baseball card in there. It's going to taste good. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, celebrate eggplant for what it was. So what we do is we take um, really fresh eggplants, and I stress this so much to everyone, it's got to be fresh. It, there's some vegetables you can get a little wiggle room with. Eggplant, man, when that stuff starts going brown, you've got to get rid of it. It is nasty. Super fresh eggplant. So when you, you cut it open, there you see little beads of water in there, and, and that's super important. We cut it like um, paper thin, and we roast it with just a little bit of oil and salt and pepper until they just become loose and translucent. We take the rest of the eggplant, and then we char grill it. And then we smoke it and we combine it with some rice and some roasted cauliflower to make like this smoked eggplant stuffing. And we wrap the stuffing around the thin slices of eggplant. So, you know, brajol, you know, classically in Italian cuisine is something as simple as a piece of meat wrapped around a piece of cheese. Or, you know, it could be something more elaborate like meat with a stuffing, which is what we played off of. And then we surround it like with this beautiful Italian salsa verde made with spinach, basil and parsley, preserved lemon and capers. And um, the dish is just, it, it just, it's still eggplant, but it just transcends the vegetable. It just becomes something so much more beautiful. The textures are beautiful. The flavors are beautiful. And um, it's what I'm proud of because it, I had to force myself, challenge myself to come up with something for eggplant. Yeah. Yeah. I love that dish. So if there's any um, new ingredients or pro products that, um, you know, you have discovered and became like an obsession to you recently? I, I'm i still in like this huge, like Sichuan Chinese phase. I mean, I just love the, these flavors going on there. They're, it's not the most vegetarian friendly cuisine in the world. So that, that, makes, that makes me step up and be like, all right, this is, yeah, this is my moment here. I got I to gotta figure out a way to do this. I just love, I love spicy food. I mean, I'm just addicted to it. I love that endorphin rush. So I've been working with a lot of those flavors, the Sichuan peppercorns, all the different kinds of chili paste and just all the flavors. Uh, my other like haunting. I just love them so much. So I've been working with those for a while. I, the thing I want to get into next, completely new to me, Ethiopian food. I love Indian food. And it reminds me of like these like, Indian food in the way that they've taken all these different little vegetables, like they have peas and they have lentils and then they do green beans and um, 
they do uh, collards, and they're all seasoned differently with uh, this combination of spices that the the whole becomes greater than the sum of its parts. Like you, you can never taste one seasoning in there. That's what I love about curry. So I really want to really want to dive into Ethiopian food and figure out what they're doing in there. To, uh, Marcus Samuelson. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have him over for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Cook. <laughs> okay. So I would like to uh, be, pick up your brain. I ask, um, you know, every guest on the show to share and um, like a, a recipe guidelines, you know, about something that a home cook like myself, you know, a food enthusiast can create, you know, at home. So, we're thinking, um, you know, maybe um, a veggie taco, you know, your style. So two two pieces of advice here. Number one, find a really good tortilla that you love. You don't have to make it. I'm flour, man. Sorry. I know I've had some amazing corn tortillas in my life. I mean, we, we took a trip to Austin last year, actually a year and a half ago before the pandemic. And they had, we went to this one restaurant where the corn tortillas were so good and so soft I, I literally had to ask the server twice if there's any flour in there whatsoever. And she said, no. And I was dumbfounded over these things. I could not believe they got the corn that soft and silky. So if you're talking those corn tortillas, I, I'm all home with those, but I'm a flour tortilla fan. And I, listen, I love food should make people happy. You don't have to go out and buy these artisanal multi-grain wheat kind of, <laughs> buy something that makes you happy. I don't care if it's white flour and, <laughs> and Crisco in there. I mean, just buy something that makes you happy. Kind of be creative with the fillings. You know, you do not have to limit tacos to, to Mexican food. I love Mexican food. It's one of my favorite cuisines in the world, but man, tacos, you have this beautiful white silky canvas of starch paint on it, paint all these different like colors, like uh, Korean tacos are very popular nowadays, but also Chinese tacos. So you think of mushu, that's another kind of taco. So maybe put mushu in your, in your tacos. And then, I mean, to me, just, just start going all through Central and South America and start thinking about all those flavors, Peruvian cuisine, Brazilian. I mean, these are, you know, most people don't make that distinction about how special and unique a lot of these Latin American cuisines are, Caribbean cuisine. Really stretch yourself out and just have some fun. And what kind of veggies do you use then in there? I'm a huge fan of uh, protein in tacos. I love tofu tacos. Uh, I could eat them every day. I love tempeh. I'm not a huge tempeh fan, but I love tempeh and tacos. Satan's great tacos. So I I love those ancient proteins and tacos. If I was going strictly veggie, I'm going cauliflower, mushroom, uh, like shredded trumpet mushrooms are fantastic. Yeah, so uh, it, you know, it depends on what you love. It's a taco, man. Anything works. Okay, yeah, <laughs> sky's the limit. Okay, cool. Just Jen here with a series of rapid fire questions, if it's okay with you. Absolutely, let's do it. So you are based in Philly. So um, let's say that I am, uh, you know, driving uh, probably like you know two hours from where I live, and then you and I are going to an, a tasting tour. In Philly, so what are like the five spots that you will take me to? Oh man, rapid fire, huh? Well, how much money do you want to spend? I mean, you know, for me, you start with our Szechuan restaurants, uh, either Dan Dan Han Dynasty or or Jane G's. Man, we got great Szechuan food. Then we go to Vietnam Town, which is off Washington Avenue. That we have such amazing Vietnamese food here. We are so lucky. I thought every city had it. They don't. So we're very lucky here. So we're going to go get some veggie pho and a banh mi. And we're going to eat them at the same time. I know that's. I know you're not supposed to do that, but you have to. So we're going to do that. So we're doing Chinese and we're doing Vietnamese. Big Italian heritage here. I mean, I want to take you to like a bare bones, rustic Italian place, of which there's just too many to count. You know, may I take you over to meet my friend Mark Vetri after that, who is an absolute artist. I mean, the guy's phenomenal with pasta. He'll change your mind about pasta. So that's three. We need to have, we need to have like Jose in there because Jose Garces is the one that introduced, you know, each other. So you have to put Jose. All right, we're going to put Jose in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, let's, we'll go up to Buena Onda and we'll get some tacos from Jose. He makes tofu tacos. Tofu tacos. They're really good, actually. The homemade tortillas, man, he's nails it. So, so there we go. So there we got those four cuisines right there. And then, oh man, what do we do next? What do we do next? You know what? I'm 
probably going to take you to a street cart and get some good falafel. It's not as good as New York, but it's it's actually pretty good here. That's nice. Sounds good. Yeah. Now I'm hungry. okay. So, what's your favorite guilty pleasure food? Oh, uh, probably falafel. Now that I just mentioned it, because now that's all I want. It's like one. Of, see, to me, a guilty pleasure. It's like you should crave it, want it every day, and when you're done eating it, hate yourself. You know. <laughs> so, I love falafel. I love French fries. Any kind of French fries I can get my hands on. I love. What do you put on your French fries? Just salt. I'm purist. Okay. You know. But um, Mm -hmm. a really good sloppy, greasy vegetarian cheesesteak, vegan cheesesteak. There's a few decent ones in town. I love those. I mean, think about the, the talk about the Philly mentality with eating. Here you have something that's like all all like bread and meat and cheese and oil and tons of salt of course it's going <laughs> to taste delicious i mean so yeah <laughs> that's why the tourists all line up for it no one from philadelphia uh, yeah, true. <laughs> but maybe not for the for the vegetarian version <laughs> uh, the vegetarian version is not bad i mean there's some the they, they're um they make them with seitan uh, we used to make one with seitan and mushrooms when we had our fast casual place man it was so good i miss that what are like the three cookbooks that inspired you the most in your career so I, I really, I've been given a lot of cookbooks over the year. I don't have a ton to talk about, but I, I, I talk about yours. Obviously, you know, uh, I I that. No, I'm not going to sell it like that. <laughs> I will tell you, there are three that, that inspired me a lot, actually, that I have. Uh, number one, speaking of the Galloping Gourmet, Graham Care, he is a cookbook. I used to watch his show in the 90s. Uh, I think it was called Graham Care's Kitchen wasn't so much the cookbook. It was the concept that inspired me because he, in the 60s, cooked with all this cream and butter and cheese and fat. And like he was like that decadent, you know, kind of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. everything bad for you chef. And he eats that way. And then his wife has a heart attack like in, in the late 70s. So he's like, oh, my God, I almost killed her. So he completely cleaned up his diet, cleaned up his cooking, and he started the show about it. But his whole philosophy was, if I'm going to take something out, I got to put something back in. I'm going to put back in flavor herbs, you know, citrus, whatever it may be. And that really inspired me for my concept. Okay, well, I'm taking all the meat out. What am I going to put back? So I have his cookbook, The In It Little Washington, very inspiring because it's just, it's what every chef wants to do. Have your little farm, your little barn house restaurant that people travel a while to. Beautiful photography in there. And then I'll give you a tie between Morimoto. I love Japanese cuisine, man. Oh my God, this book is insane. It's so beautiful. And uh Philly classic, Lebec Finn. I know George Perrier, love him or hate him. I know. But the Lebec Finn was the epitome of classical fine dining in the city. And he he kept Philadelphia on the culinary map for decades because of Lebec Finn. And that book is just beautiful. Okay. Thank you. So the last one, what's your biggest pet peeves in the kitchen? Oh, uh, yeah. how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll give you the simple answers. Pet peeves, bad personal hygiene. I can't stand when I see someone cough into their hands. I can't stand seeing someone sneeze and not being very, very aware of what just happened and taking all sneezing is the equivalent of almost cutting yourself. You got to, you got to be careful about that. Touching your face, touching your nose. I mean, I I believe in like this almost hospital like setting in the kitchen. You know, you got to be really, really great with hygiene. I don't like running out of things. I do not like 86ing things. Uh, that's a pet peeve of mine. When I go to a restaurant at, at 8.30 at night and they're out of three things, that shows me the kitchen wasn't prepared and they're not taking kitchen life seriously. 10.30, that's a different story maybe on, a, on one night. But I guess my biggest pet peeve of all is you know just pushback. I'm not a militant chef. I don't boss people around. I don't yell at people. I ask people to do something. And that's like, come on, I'm doing my job. Let's do it. And sometimes you get a little, you know, a little, well, why are we doing this? How about if we do this? No, no, come on. I need to get this done. I just need to be done, you know? So I I like simplicity in the kitchen, you know? So um, those are my three. Very cool. Chef, thank you so much uh, for accepting being a guest on on the show. I was really pleased to, to have you on. Oh, it was absolutely my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the episodes on Flavors Unknown. I cannot wait to take a trip to Philadelphia and eat at Veg to taste the great flavors from Chef Richard Lando. If you have listened until now, it means that you found the content of this episode to your taste. So do me a favor. Please share it with one of your friends. 
You can do it very easily from your phone. On Apple Podcasts, just look for the little purple circle with three dots on the episode screen, click share, and text your friend. On Spotify, look for the little three white dots on the episode screen, scroll down, and click share and text it to your friend. Please subscribe or follow the show and see you on the next episode. My next guest will be Chef Shamil Velasquez from the Lini Oyster House in Charleston. He will share how his Puerto Rican heritage influences his cooking. I see you in two weeks. And until then, remember that people who love to eat are always the best people. Thanks for listening to Flavors Unknown. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review. Find the show notes at flavorsunknown.com. And if you want to join the Flavors Unknown community, search Flavors Unknown on Instagram and Twitter.